Yeah. The life of Darlene Anderson. But to properly celebrate her life, we need to properly celebrate the resurrection and the new hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So at this time, uh, please silence your phones if you have not already. Uh, but let's celebrate the resurrection and celebrate the life of Darlene. Let's first start with a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the life of Darlene Anderson, her faithfulness, her passion, most importantly, her love for you was evident from the day she put from the day she first put her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ until her last breath on earth. Father, today we may mourn her loss, but we certainly don't mourn as people without hope. Instead, we mourn as people with hope because we do have a heavenly hope in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, let us celebrate the life of your faithful servant by celebrating what you have accomplished on the cross, by bringing us new life because of your son's death and resurrection on the cross. Father, let this time be a time to magnify your name, the name that is above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'd ask you if you're able to stand, please rise as we join in song with a few verses of Rock of Ages left for me, let me hide 
myself in thee. Rock of ages, clutch for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the waters and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be us in the double pure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no rest but know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must say, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Fall I to the fountain fly, wash me safe or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my so close in death when I saw two worlds unknown. See the on thy judgment throne, rock of ages left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The gift of eternal life. These are selected verses from Paul's epistle to the Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. All ascend and fall short of the glory of God. But when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, the, from wrath through him. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we also have access by faith into his grace, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according 
to the spirit where I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning, everyone. Um, I also want to thank everyone for coming to help us celebrate um, my mother's life, which was uh, very, very full and productive. And um, I'm going to read, um, it's in your program, a little bit of a synopsis of her life. But first, um, I wanted to share with you their life verse uh, from way back in the mid-1950s when they answered their call to go uh, in service to the Lord to a foreign, actually in the beginning to India, um, but uh, ended up going to the Philippines. Uh, from Matthew 9, <clears throat> 37 to 38, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. <clears throat> I'm going to get um, the water. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Um, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And that is the call that my folks answered. And from uh, their commissioning service at Lakeview Bible Church, which is where they attended in Wisconsin, um, to start their ministry, a very old hymn that maybe some of you um, have heard in the past. Just wanted to read the first verse from their commissioning service. So send I you, so send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And I have vivid recollections of that service um, uh, before we were on our way to deputation and then on to the Philippines. So um, in your programs, I'm gonna uh, share with you the synopsis that my sister, uh, Avely, wrote, um, Remembering Darlene. So Darlene Jeanette Anderson, moved from the home she shared with Pete and Valerie Winalda for the past eight years to her her eternal home in heaven with her Lord Jesus Christ on March 5th, 2024 at the age of 94. Darlene was born and grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota as the only child of Swedish immigrant Harry Carlson and his wife, Irene. At age 18, Darlene married her high school sweetheart, Vernon Anderson, a marriage that lasted 65 years until his death in 2012. Darlene described herself in her youth as an American pagan pursuing worldly pleasures and lacking any religious affiliation or interest in spiritual things. It wasn't until after the birth of their first child, Laurel, and a move to Wisconsin for Vernon's job that Darlene understood the way of salvation through the patient witness of their landlady. Darlene trusted in Jesus Christ as her savior at the age of 22, and her life was radically transformed. Suddenly, she and Vernon couldn't get enough of studying the Bible with their pastor and involvement at this Lakeview Bible Church that I uh, mentioned. To further their learning, they spent a year at Milwaukee Bible Institute. A mission conference they attended during that time set them on fire to serve the Lord overseas, following Hudson Taylor's example of going out by faith in the Lord to provide without asking for money. And I was part of that. We were very privileged to live in our first house in the Philippines to have fruit trees in the backyard because my folks went out, I think, with a $10 a month support promised um, by David Noble, who was actually a student. So um, it's probably why I still don't like bananas very well, because we ate a lot of bananas during that time. <laughs> After completing a summer Institute of Linguistics course in Canada and a missionary medical course at Biola in California, they packed their belongings in 50-gallon metal barrels and set off with their daughters, Laurel and myself, on a three-week voyage by passenger ship. I always say we were cruising 
way before cruising was ever popular, uh, to the Philippines as the first missionaries sent up by Things to Come Mission. Arriving on January 1st, 1958, Vernon and Darlene immediately set about their ministry of preaching, teaching, and training. Armed with Bible and portable flannel graph board, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the Highway of the Life flannel graph series, which I loved also as a child. Um, she taught um, many, many, many children in the Philippines, just under trees um, in the barrios. Vernon and Darlene's decision to stay on after losing 11-year-old Laurel their oldest daughter to meningitis early in their second year, knit the hearts of the Filipinos with theirs and set a foundation for work that is still thriving today with over 600 churches, six Bible schools, and over 30 Filipino missionaries serving in other parts of the world. Brennan yeah, and Darlene's pioneering spirit and passion for spreading the gospel to the regions beyond eventually led them to serve in Indonesia, Tanzania, Brazil, Kenya, Cameroon and South Africa with short terms in India, Europe, uh, including smuggling Bibles into Eastern Europe um, and Turkey. Every movement uprooting and adjusting to a new country, a new culture, new language, new food and a new way of life, but most significantly for them, new people to evangelize and train in the Bible and Christian ministry. The things that did not change were Darlene's gracious open door hospitality, daily family devotions, and maintaining a well-run household, even though it meant learning to shop in local markets, cook with kerosene, wood, and charcoal stoves, bake bread in a tin oven set over a burner, store food without a refrigerator, wash clothes by hand, sleep under mosquito nets, a straw mats, or simple foam mattresses, and my mother was very good, let me tell you, at killing snakes with the bolo, which is like a machete, including one that she found under my father's pillow one morning. And I was ran into the bedroom. I was a big help. I ran into the other bedroom screaming up on the bed while my mother did away with the snake. Many lizards and geckos and other wildlife that invaded our home. Darlene creatively juggled language study and ministry engagements with homeschooling Ben, Val and Amy through their elementary school years. In 2005, after 47 years as overseas missionaries, Vernon's declining health necessitated moving home to the USA. They settled in Indianapolis and spent their final years working at the TCM headquarters office. Darlene loved Vernon to the end as his caregiver, companion, and confidant, and admitted that being a widow was not easy. And uh, she always would call me and say, the silence is deafening. When arthritis forced Darlene at 90 to retire from going to the office every day, she continued to do what she could from home and maintained lifelong habits of prayer and generous, cheerful giving to support TCM and other Christian missionaries around the world. Darlene's wholehearted dedication to the Lord, combined with her strength of character, incessant curiosity, and active interest in learning new things and getting to know new people propelled her through the plethora of challenges and transitions she encountered throughout her life. When urged by many to write a book, Darlene insisted she'd already done so through the thousands of letters she hand wrote, typed on a manual typewriter, or later emailed to her parents, children, friends, and supporters. Her legacy lives on through people all across the world whose lives she impacted. Darlene was preceded in death by her oldest child, Laurel Anderson, in 1959, daughter-in-law Donna Anderson, Ben's first wife, in 1985, husband, Vernon Anderson in 2012, and great-grandson Rowan Heath, uh, Robbie and Tegwin Heath's second son. She is survived by her children, Hope, Ben, Valerie, and Amy, and grandchildren, Stephanie, Emily, Tegwin, Jacqueline, Francis, Christina, Daniel, and David, and 15 great-grandchildren. Lastly, I just wanna share the last verse that I think of after my mother died. And after my father died as well from 2 Timothy 4, 7, uh, and you all know this verse, I have fought the good fight, that we could all say that at the end of our lives. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me in that final day. And that's the way I want to see my mom with the crown of righteousness on her head. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll ask us again if you're able to stand. Let's rise.
We're going to sing a few verses. A wonderful hymn. Great is thy faithfulness. wife playing the piano. have to say it's oh I'm sorry <laughs> the words of the apostle Paul in the first letter to the Thessalonians the fourth chapter but I but I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. I had the privilege of being Darlene's pastor for 12 years. Um, 
Even standing here, I can picture her about where John is right now. The seating was a little different pre-COVID and she was never able to return to the, to, uh, the, the church after um, the pandemic. Um, and then Adam, you would be sitting right next to her, right? Correct. Exactly. I can picture that for, for many, many years. I could look there and see her smiling face. And everything that has been said and will be said during the testimony time about her life, I can vouch as her pastor to, to be true. Her faithfulness, her commit, commitment, her dedication, her love for the Lord, the support that she gives for those in the ministry, all of that is, is accurate. And it was a privilege, a true privilege, to be able to serve her in that way as her pastor. But long before I was her pastor, we were co-workers as missionaries. And missionaries, the, this tight-knit fraternity of missionaries, one thing that we often do when we would get together is tell stories. And she loved to tell missionary stories. Vernon loved to tell missionary stories. And when, when the missionaries get together, it's almost like a competition. But of course, with their history and the amount of time they were on the mission field, there was no competition. You could not outdo their missionary stories. But all of the various experiences that they had over the years. And what I remember about Darlene, she was in our home many times in the Philippines, her and, and, and Vernon traveling through and visiting. And I remember uh, one time we were sitting around telling these stories and she loved to laugh. Everybody knows that. She was always, you know, she just loved the, just the joy of laughter and all of the stories that would make her laugh. And she told one story. I can't remember now if it was Vernon or Darlene who told the story, but they, they were together with us. And they, they told the story of one time when they were in a remote village, I think in the Philippines, might have been Indonesia, I'm not sure, but they were in this very remote village going to preach far up in the mountains. They were there with, uh, with the, the man who was translating for them. And they came to the family that was hosting them and they asked them to pray for their carabao, the water buffalo, which they used, uh, the farmers would use that for plowing the fields and for carrying heavy loads and uh, all types of different uh, uses. So if the carabao was sick, the family was in very, a very difficult situation. So they asked Vernon to pray for the carabao. Now he wasn't used to doing that kind of thing and he felt a little uncomfortable, but he wasn't going to offend his host family. So they, they prayed over the carabao and in the middle of the prayer suddenly the carabao this rush of water came out and splattered Vernon all over and all of a sudden the family started praising the Lord and laughing and singing and and so Vernon asked the translator well what was the problem with the carabao why was it sick and they said it couldn't urinate <laughs> and hearing that story I could just hear Darlene's, even telling the story now, I can hear her laughter as she's, you know, as she would hear that and just burst out. So that's really the, the thing that I remember so clearly about her was her, her joy for life, her commitment, her dedication, and her love for laughter. There are a lot of stories. It's hard to condense somebody's 94 years of a very full life into just a few uh, short paragraphs or a few short minutes. Um, I did want to share something I wrote. This is a tribute to my mother. I first wrote it in um, about 14 years ago when she had turned 80 uh, as a tribute to her. And then I updated it again about four years ago. Um, and so this is a tribute to my mother based on Verses from Pro Proverbs 31. A woman of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. I've found her. My mom is a unique and marvelous treasure, a priceless mother, mentor, and friend who I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. When her fiery chariot comes to collect her, I'll be delighted if she leaves me even a half portion of her spirit. And I mean that. <laughs> 
The second verse, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. My dad was able to travel far and wide to preach and teach because he could count on my mom to hold the fort in his absence. He got to minister behind the Iron Curtain one summer because he was confident my mom could get herself and the kids by train from London to Dover, across the English Channel, onto the Brussels airport to catch a flight to the States, buy a car, drive them all the way from New Jersey to Colorado, rent a house and get everyone settled while he stayed in Europe. That confidence was well-placed. The third verse, she brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. My mom did run into my dad with the car once and broke his leg, <laughs> but she made up for it by taking a punch for him, literally, a few years later when someone threatened him. My mom served as my dad's eyes when macular degeneration limited his vision and served as his voice when a stroke took his speaking ability. Her uncomplaining willingness to take on all the driving, correspondence, banking, and reading impressed me deeply. Next verse, she selects wood, wool, and flax and works with eager hands. My mom knows the difference between all kinds of fabrics, and she has made everything from curtains to clothing for us, as well as our dolls. She has eagerly decorated the multitude of houses she li she's lived in on five continents with captivating international flair. You ever visited her, you knew that, <laughs> and made them feel like home. Right down to her collection of airline silverware from the good old days when airlines had silverware. Now, she did ask for them as a keepsake. She didn't just take them. <laughs> the next verse, she's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. My mom could spend a lot of time wheeling her shopping cart through Kroger, but she could also hold her own in any African or Asian open market. She even learned how to shop and stock up in Tanzania where the nearest grocery store was many muddy four-wheel drive miles away. And she never knew what would be available or if she would ever be able to find it again. The next verse, she gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. Throughout her motherhood, my mother prepared three proper meals a day. She's such a good cook that my dad found restaurant food disappointing. When we lived in Indonesia, everyone knew when her home-baked bread was coming out of the oven, and they showed up right on time. I still don't know how she managed without a refrigerator for so many years. She even learned to cook on a wood stove, and I can attest to some remarkable meals created with one pot, a pressure cooker, and a finicky charcoal burner which that was all we had for about seven weeks on our first visit to Africa. She trained up all of the helpers, the girls that would come to live with us, we had over the years, and they still call her mom. The next verse, she considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. She plants a vineyard. My mom's not into fields, but she's bought and cared for a lot of house plants over the years. She can bargain with the best and get such good prices that we always teased her about robbing the poor salesman. Long before there was homeschool curriculum, she considered a lot of educational materials, ordered what she needed, and homeschooled her last three kids through elementary school. She sets about her, ta about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. This reminds me of all the years my mom washed clothes by hand. No one, and I mean no one, can wring anything as dry as she can. She had to do most of her cooking from scratch without electric mixers, and she could definitely knead bread dough and literally whip up cakes and egg whites. And watch out when she took up a machete to go after snakes or a broom to chase out rats. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. Mostly because my mom's doing crossword puzzles or reading a good book, but she has been known to drive a dead body around in the back of the car in the dark of night. You can ask me about that later. And to negotiate with armed robbers to take less than they came for that night because this was the Lord's money. <laughs> in her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. My mom could knit, crochet, embroider, and sew just about anything by hand or by machine mostly on the old Singer treadle machines. She could also type rapidly and accurately on a manual typewriter. Some of you don't even remember what those are. <laughs> she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. 
There are people who are literally alive today because of my mom's compassion and her efforts to get them the critical medical help that they needed. My mom was often praying for a million dollars to put in her cheerful giving fund. That's what she called it. But I dare say she gave away well over a million dollars over the course of her life to those in need. I do recall though that she was not too pleased with us giving clothes out of the rag bag to our street urchin friends. <laughs> when it snows, she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. I suppose being from Minnesota, my mother had no fear of snow, although she adjusted remarkably well to living in the sweaty heat of the tropics. She knitted mittens for all of us during snowy winters we spent in Colorado. And in a blinding blizzard, she parceled out her kids to get to the hospital 45 miles away where she gave birth to my younger sister while my dad was away on a trip. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. My mom has sewn her own sheets and bedspreads and sewed countless complicated mattress covers for the Bible school in Kenya. She's made clothes for all of us and she's ingenious at finding fashionable things at the Goodwill. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. In 2008, my parents were the guests of honor at the 50th anniversary of Things to Come Mission in the Philippines, the work that they helped to establish. With my mom at his side, my dad spent 47 years pioneering and or providing leadership for ministries in the Philippines, Indonesia, Tanzania, Brazil, Kenya, Cameroon, and South Africa, as well as India, Europe, and Turkey. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. Selling was never her thing, but she graciously made baked goods for the East Africa Women's League bazaars and contributed her time and used items for church sales. She also chose material and accessories and found a, a seamstress to craft my sister's wedding in the special Filipino style when my sister was all the way on the other side of the world and wasn't even around to be measured. And those were the days long before the internet and instant communication. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. It takes strength to uproot your new culture and language and to do that multiple times. I still don't know how my mom went from a middle-class Midwest life in Minneapolis where she'd never eaten rice or seen a cockroach to relishing all sorts of international cuisine and living fearlessly and contentedly in places crawling with ants, rats, snails, snakes, bats, and even bush babies. It takes strength to stay on the mission field after losing your oldest daughter a year after your arrival. It takes strength to... Bring confidence in God, and that's what my mom had. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. My mom faithfully made sure we had family devotions every day, and through them led me to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. As I got older, she taught me that the real question is not whether something is right or wrong, but whether it leads to holiness. If the saying, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten is true, then everything I've needed to know I've learned from my mom, not just in kindergarten, but throughout my life. Even though all her children have college degrees and are educated, as my dad used to say, rarely does a day go by that at least one of us doesn't ask her for advice. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. My mom provided us with nutritious meals every day and made us take our vitamins. She made us eat things we didn't like, which has proven its worth many times over in my own life, although you can still hold the eggplant. I still hear her voice instructing me when I fold mosquito nets or fold sheets, and she taught me how to pack a suitcase so well that keeping within the 50-pound limit is virtually impossible. She was certainly not idle. Even at 90, she was still going to the office and put in a good five days' work. And it's a good thing the library limited, to her, limited her to checking out only 50 books at a time. And the, the uh, passage in Proverbs 31 ends with, her children arise and call her bless, blessed. That's what we are doing today. Her husband also, and he praised her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. 
Charm is deceptive and beauty is, <clears throat> beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Good morning again. My name is Barb Stellos. I'm here to sing a song in Darlene's honor. Somewhere around the fifth paragraph of the story that we read in our program, Darlene's life, there is one word, the country Brazil. That's when I got to know Darlene some 33 years ago. And I had a wonderful encounter with her out in Ohio, the home where I was staying. And wouldn't you know, that interest was piqued when I heard she had a list of everything a missionary would need to pack in one suitcase under 50 pounds. <laughs> and thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. I was one of the people that was touched by Darlene's life. My husband and I are here, fruit of Vernon and, Vernon and Darlene's prayers and many others. I'd like to share a song now reminding us of the air that we'll breathe in heaven. May this be a blessing to you. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before him there when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the Lord. every prayer we prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the land that was slain forever he shall reign so let it be today we shall him of heaven with angels and the saints we raise a mighty roar glory to our god who gave his life beyond the grave holy holy is the lord holy
out before him. There will be a day when death is no more. We are reminded of that reality in that song and that reality that one day that will be true and that will be the case. So at this time, we're going to make this somewhat sort of brief, but um, we certainly want as many as, as we can. But if you would like to share a memory of Darlene or a story, uh, now is your time to do that. So we're going to have this be a, an open mic, open microphone. I'm going to step aside. And if you feel led to share a memory about Dar Darlene, please do that right now. I remember Darlene and her late husband, Burden. Burden Anderson and Darlene Anderson are like grandparents to me. In the early times, I remember where Burden and Darlene sat in front of me at Grace Church. And in the late times, I remember where Darlene sat next to me at Grace Church when Burden passed away. When Burden and Darlene always greeted me before the service, and they always said to me to have a nice week after the service. And they gave me encouragement from God, and they always shook my hand before the service and after the service. Burden Anderson and Darlene Anderson were great missionaries to give God's word to nations all over the world, to people. To, so people can accept Jesus as their Lord and as their savior. And I remember the gifts that Darlene gave to me. It, one is the, um, the, 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 the devotional of the Psalms and of Proverbs there in, in New, Lip, New International Version, and also the, the doors of the Bible there from the Ark Encounter that says the, yep, the Ark door, the Passover door, the, the temples entered doors, the sheep's door, the cross, the tomb's door, and the narrow door there. Now, Darlene is with Vernon in heaven. Let's go back to, sorry, 19, the early 1970s. As a young man, I allowed untruth to invade my mind, and I operated my decider in an unholy fashion, okay? My parents were uh, good friends of the Andersons. One of the things that my parents would do and talk to me as a young man they would say Vernon and Darlene are going to be at church Sunday would you come their faithfulness even though they weren't right there in front of me what they preached and said was in my mind as truth overcoming the untruth they were a very important part of this principle being fulfilled in my life train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old no, i'm not there yet I've wanted to say, when he is old he will not depart from it i praise the lord for the faithfulness of those people Count yourselves among them. Thank you. Oh, 
My wife will kill me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, she hated the song, He Stopped Loving Her Today, by George Jones. And uh, anyway, she was in the hospital, unconscious. And I did something the doctors couldn't do. I sang to her, he stopped loving her today. And she went. <laughs> woke her up. I'll try to bring a little dignity back to the service. <laughs> so years ago, I can't exactly quote what year it was, but I do remember being present for a service at Grace Church on English Avenue, 2200 English Avenue. And at the uh, part of the service, I believe it was the end, the founder of the church, Pastor John LeVere Sr., um, announced that there was a decision to be made soon as to whether our church would open its doors and we had a newer building. We also had an older building that really wasn't being used. And growing up in the Grace Church movement, I was from Pennsylvania, but part of that movement, um, we just had missionaries come in. They'd stay for a while and deputation and whatnot, and then they'd go on. But this was different because this decision to be made was to relocate or locate the corporate headquarters of Things to Come Mission in the church here in Indianapolis. Indianapolis, if you're not from here, it's known as the crossroads of America for obvious reasons. We're pretty central and lots of good highways around. But what a wonderful thing that was to be able to use that real estate, not worth much as the world standards, not in the best area of town, but how God used that. And we benefited here at Grace Church from all of the the constant visitation of missionaries on, on deputation coming and, and, and going and going around the country. And it just brought missions so much alive to me. And at the heart of that, of course, were the Watkins and the Andersons. And um, I know this is Darlene's funeral, but I, I honor all of them for what they did. When I look at this and I read 600 churches in the world exist today, mostly because of their faithfulness to God, and I praise God for that. I'm <laughs> 
I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able again as we sing the final hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All oh, because we do not tarry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Please remain standing as Pastor Troy comes with a closing prayer. Well, I do have a couple of announcements before I close in prayer. First of all, if you would like to linger around a little bit after, uh, we have some refreshments in the back there lobby, but also um, feel free to... Uh, Pete and Val have invited all of us, uh, if you feel called, to uh, come to their house for a light lunch. The address is going to be in your bulletin there. And if you also feel called to make a, a financial donation in uh, Darlene's honor, please give to the Darlene's uh, Cheerful Giving Fund, uh, made out to Things to Come Mission. And there's a website link on your bulletin. And uh, definitely wanted to give a special thanks to Heartland Hospice for 19 months of excellent care for Darlene. Yeah, we want to give them a, a round of applause. Uh, Agape Bermero for producing the wonderful video that we saw to open. We want to thank uh, the, their uh, work for that. And also we wanted to thank the church, uh, Darlene's Church, Grace Church, for, for hosting this event and uh, everything with uh, technology. But yes, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are so thankful for Darlene's life. We are so thankful for her faithfulness to you and the legacy that she now lives on through ch uh, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Let us be a reminder that one day all of us will be face-to-face -face with our Savior. And the only thing that's going to matter is, are we saved? Have we trusted in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have we finished well? And Father, we know that Darlene has finished well. We know that everything leads back to when she was 22 years old in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, putting her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, if any of us here today have not done that, I pray that today this will be a reminder of eternity and a reminder and an opportunity to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Father, we're so thankful for her life again. Let us be challenged by her life to live a fruitful life that is reflective of the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. Father, we thank you and we praise you for her life, but also to the new life that we can walk today in your riches and your goodness. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.